everyone. Day two of press conferences at the EGU 2016 General Assembly. And starting this morning, we have a press conference on volcanoes, climate changes, and drought, civilizational resilience, and collapse. Uh, and I'd like to remind you that the floor will be open for questions from journalists in the room and from those watching remotely following short presentations by each one of the speakers. And press releases and other documents relating to this and other press conferences are available at media.egu.eu slash documents. Taking part in this press conference, we have five panelists. Uh, the first one is Brian Dermody. He's a researcher at the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development, Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Linda Kuhl, I hope, sorry if I mispronounced that, PhD candidate at the Center for Water Resource Systems at uh, the Vienna University of Technology here in Vienna. Kes Norren is a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Geosciences, Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Matthew Tuhi, who is a researcher at the Geomar Helmut Center for Ocean Research Kiel and at the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology in Germany. And Francis Ludlow is a lecturer at the Department of History and Center for Envi Environmental Humanities, Trinity College Dublin, Ireland. And I'll now hand over to our speakers. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, so yes, my name is Brian Dermody and I'm an environmental scientist at the Copernicus Institute at Utrecht. And I'm going to talk about some work we've been doing on looking at the societal resilience of the Roman uh, Empire to hydro-climatic change. So you might be wondering why environmental scientists are interested in the Roman uh, world. And well, as environmental scientists, we're interested in the, uh, the interaction between humans and the environment and how they play out over the long term in terms of sustainability. And so for us, it's very interesting to look at these past societies because you can look at these interactions and actually see how they played out on the long term and what worked for them and what didn't. And with the Romans, they're very interesting because there are a number of parallels with our current society. They were a highly urbanized uh, civilization that had to depend on long distance trade routes to uh, ensure a stable food supply to their society. So we did previous work on this, looking at uh, how they use trade to deal with climate variability within their empire. And it was, turned out to be a very uh, efficient method of dealing with climate variability, because if one region was suffering a deficit in yields, they could import from other regions with surplus. But what we're interested in this study to look at is how this system of trade and irrigation that the Romans used to supply their food could deal with longer term changes in climate related to Holocene climate anomalies. So during the Roman period, climate went from a warm climate called the Roman warm period to cooler climate called the dark ages cold period. And this also had impacts on uh, precipitation patterns over, the, over Europe and over the empire at this time. So in order to look at this, we started by uh, reconstructing Roman population distribution and Roman uh, agriculture. And we did this in a novel way by, we took uh, 15,000 uh, archeological sites that were Roman sites from uh, active in 200 AD. And from this, we made a density of sites. And we combined this with uh, crop suitability maps for vines, olives, millet, and wheat, which were like the main uh, crops uh, that the Romans depended on for their calor calorific intake. And from this, we could derive maps of where Romans were living and what crops they were growing. And we uh, incorporated these into um, a hydrological model, PCR, global water balance model. And with this, we could uh, calculate, based on climate forcing, how yields varied between the Roman warm period and the Dark Ages cold period. So what influence these changes, long-term changes in climate at this time had on uh, Roman uh, crop yields. And our preliminary results on this are, you can see um, in the northern part of the empire, you, uh, as we went into the Dark Ages cold period, there was a reduction in yields in most crops compared to the Roman warm period. Whereas you could surprisingly somewhat, you can see that around the Mediterranean basin, there was actually an increase in yields in uh, many of these crops for this colder period. And what I guess the take home message of this is that um, rather than just uh, inferring a simple impact of uh, climate variability on a civilization, if you use these kind of uh, approaches of uh, actually modeling what those impacts are, you get more of a subtle a uh, picture of what the impact of these climate changes are. So our next steps are we're going to uh, explore the role that trade had uh, in terms of uh, dealing, helping the Romans to deal with these longer term climate variations. So we use a trade net network 
that was developed by classicists at Stanford that uh, estimates the cost of uh, redistributing goods around the empire based on cost distance analysis and Diocletian's edict on maximum prices. And the ultimate goal of this is to provide a platform of bringing together historical data and biophysical data about the Roman world to better understand that society and hopefully uh, tell us something about uh, our own society in terms of sustainability. Thank you. Thank you. Linda, you can speak. Would you, uh, could you try speaking closer to the microphone because of the web streaming? Mm -hmm. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Linda Kyle. I'm, uh, can you hear this way? Um, I'm uh, stu doing my PhD at the Center of Water Resource System here in Vienna. Uh, and I'm looking uh, into uh, the rise and fall of the ancient Maya civilization through social hydrological modeling. And as you may know, this was a, uh, or is a civilization that reached a peak uh, during the, at the end of the eighth century. Uh, and afterwards, um, it fell, it, it collapsed, uh, so to say. Uh, several explanations, explanations are put forward for this uh, fall, uh, among which are a volcanism, which we, well, we connect to here also in this session, um, but also a collapse of trade or uh, env environmental degradation. Um, but what we focus on in our study is drawal of droughts. Um, so what we know, what uh, our geologists have found out is that uh, some, some Maya centers build reservoirs for irrigation and drinking water purposes. And uh, what we, our simulations show that while these reservoirs help the ancient Maya society to reach higher population levels and to sustain growth, they also made the Maya more vulnerable in case of major droughts. And so uh, the implication for us is, uh, as a current society as well, technology can also backfire. And how we study this is by a model framework, framework that connects the hydrological um, uh, <laughs> dynamics with the social dynamics, so to say. Um, so um, a bit of background on these results. Uh, what we need, the data there in the last, uh, years there are uh, improved estimates of climate variability made by paleo uh, climatologists and our geologists and um, they're showing uh, recurrent droughts uh, during the period of the collapse uh, so implying that the drought signal could be uh, a very uh, a relevant factor in the collapse of the mayas uh, we coupled it with demographic data and we looked at some local land water features and what you see also on the slide is Fort Tikal, one of the major city centers, the peak in population during the classic period and it's collapsed. And overall the, the area where the Maya uh, were living during that time uh, in the north central of, of America. Uh, and in, um, in contrast a little bit to our previous speaker is what um, characterizes this model approach is its simplicity. So there are only five differential equations, which has an advantage that uh, the, it's very transparent and, and requires a low amount of data in order to get results. Uh, and how we conceptualize this is that a, a, a small society or a society settles into an area and needs, uh, starts cultivating its agriculture. The Maya were a subsistence agriculture uh, society. And as long as that positive feedback loop is going on, the population continues to increase. But as soon as either by it reaching the, the limits of its local uh, area, but also uh, when, for example, drought hit and, and rainfall is lower than normal, uh, that positive loop is, um, is interrupted. And um, well, there are several ways uh, the Maya is you, you could say they would have adapted to their environment and one is building reservoirs, which we also have in this framework presented. Uh, and here, uh, some of the results where you see uh, in the top panel, the precipitation series uh, based on the climate, uh, uh, paleoclimate data, 
uh, of Medina Elizalde in this case. Um, and uh, in the second panel, you see the water storage uh, in, the, in the catchment. So, yeah. Um, and what you see in, in, when we jump to the lower panel is that uh, during the, the classic period, uh, the Maya really went up until their maximum of their carrying capacity, carrying capacity, <laughs> carrying capacity. So you see this, uh, uh, yeah, they're really reaching their limits. You see an increase in vulnerability or in, in, in food security. Um, in the second last panel, uh, this model, um, or yeah, it leads them to build the reservoirs, which you see in the second panel. And what you then see is that these reservoirs allow uh, the society to uh, to sustain higher population levels, but also when this really, yeah, these big droughts uh, uh, happen, they are impacted more severe. And uh, well, this is as far as a case study of a general. Uh, um, uh, social hydrological uh, modeling, so to say. And so what we're now doing is applying this uh, same model framework also to a contemporary case, and we're actually looking at water and uh, food security in Kenya. So see what happens, uh, wh which parallels we can draw uh, with the ancient Maya. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kees Noren. I'm working at uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Uh, we're doing research in the uh, River Delta in uh, southern Mexico. And well, we found that evidence that there was a large eruption uh, of a Mexican volcano in uh, 540 AD. And we think it's related to the Dark Age of uh, Maya civilization. Well, Linda already talked about uh, the, the classic uh, collapse uh, around 800 AD. Um, and she referred to the golden age of Maya civilization during the classic period uh, that lasted from uh, 250 till 800 AD. And you can see on the map the major cities that were constructed uh, during that period. And the area was very densely populated. It was really, really especially in the, if you look at the high concentration in northern uh, Guatemala and adjacent areas in, uh, in Mexico and uh, Belize. But we'll zoom in a little bit on that area. And here I highlighted the sites where a lot of dated monuments were found. Uh, the Mayas, they erected a lot of uh, uh, stellas uh, with dated dates on them. Uh, you can translate the dates to our calendar system. And these are the sites with a lot of uh, findings uh, of dates. And if you look at the chronology of the dates, uh, you, you can uh, indicate on the, on the lower panel, you can see that it's, it's uh, a period where a lot of dates are missing. Yeah, it's called the hiatus. It's, it started around 540 AD, and it lasted well up to the end of the sixth century. And it was uh, well, there's archaeological evidence for uh, increased warfare, uh, culminating in a so-called Star War, uh, when Tycho was uh, defeated by uh, aliens of uh, Caracol and Kalakmu. So there was a lot, a lot of unrest and abandonment of sites. But the main question is, well, what happened? Yeah, what happened in 540 AD? And well, also, there was also many speculations about uh, reduced influence of uh, Teotihuacan, a uh, large center in uh, near Mexico City, or maybe a uh, prolonged drought. But there's also ideas that there was uh, a large explosive eruption uh, in that period. And there are American researchers, uh, they made a nice documentary about uh, uh, the reconstruction of a uh, large eruption of Ilopango volcano in uh, El Salvador. And it's, it's they claiming that the Ilopango eruption occurred in 540 AD, and it produced a, la a large aerosol uh, cloud into the stratosphere and also causing global uh, climate change. Well, Matthew will uh, f uh, follow on that uh, after, after me. So the, here you can see that the aerosol cloud, the stratospheric aerosol cloud spread globally, and it also deposits volcanic sulfate on the on the ice cores. 
And so you can trace the volcanic signal in, your, in the ice core records. And because they are annually laminated, you can really date past volcanic eruptions. So we have a large spike in the ice core records at 540. So this is the, well, this suggests the Ilopango in El Salvador as the, as the, uh, as the source. Well, they, they have dated uh, a, a tree from pyrocrastic flow uh, deposits. And you can really carbon date uh, this, uh, this tree. And in the red squares are the, uh, the, the, the dated uh, samples. And they indicate that it's quite possible that it was an eruption in 540. But you can also shift the dates a little bit. And then you get a date 100 years earlier. Uh, the problem is with the calibration curve that there's a plateau. So the, there's a large time window for the occurrence of this eruption. Well, we think that there was another volcano, and it was uh, El Chichon in uh, southern Mexico. It had a very large eruption in 1982. It was the worst volcanic disaster in modern uh, Mexican uh, history. And you can see the, the well, the, the, it produced a lot of tephra fall uh, also here in, uh, in Palenque. And, but the volcano had also a large explosive eruption in the past as well. Well, here's the dis distribution of the ash fall uh, in 1982. So it was directed towards the Maya lowlands. So indicating that it could have a possible direct impact on the, on the Maya lowlands itself. Instead of the Ilopango, it was spread to the southeast. So it's le less likely that you have the direct impact. Well, we're focusing uh, on, the, on the river delta in the north. Uh, we're studying sediment cores from the flood basin where we can, where, where air fault tephra is incorporated into the, into the sediments. And you have also the world's largest beach ridge system at the coast. So volcanic material that is tra transported towards the coast is incorporated in, into the sandy beach ridge uh, sequence. And it's a very high resolution record. They can exactly date uh, the occurrence of, uh, of the eruption. So here I put all the, uh, our data samples together. So we have, from the literature, the, the, the purple circle is the date from uh, uh, proximal uh, deposits near the volcano. Well, we had already in a date in 2009, the, the blue, uh, blue square. But now we have additional dates, the red, uh, the, uh, the red squares, and also the triangles, the, the beach ridge sequence. And as you can see, if you combine these dates, you get a eruption date of 546 plus or minus 16. So we have a very narrow time window. And it's, uh, it indicates that it's very likely that there was a large eruption in 540 uh, AD. And well, I will discuss this in more detail uh, on Friday afternoon. So if you have time, you can visit uh, the presentation uh, quarter to five on Friday afternoon. Uh, OK, thank you very much. Okay, hi, I'm Matthew Tui. I'm from the Guillemar Helmholt Center for Ocean Research Kiel, Germany. Um, this is work I've done with colleagues from the University of um, Oslo in Norway and the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland. Um, and I'm happy to say that the paper um, that presents these results was just published this past weekend. So it's available for download from Climatic Change. So what we've done in this study um, is using ice core data and um, observations from the year 536 reconstructed the magnitude of two volcanic eruptions, one in the year 536 and one in 540. Um, using state-of-the-art climate models, we then estimated the impact of the stratospheric sulfate aerosols from these two eruptions on the amount of sunlight 
getting to the surface of the Earth, um, and then the results or the impacts of those on global climate. Um, and we're able to show that considered together, these two volcanic eruptions, what we call a double event, had a stronger impact on northern hemisphere climate than any volcanic eruption or sequence of eruptions from at least the last 1,200 years. Um, and this double event likely had significant direct impact on agricultural societies, especially in the northernmost limit of settlement, um, uh, for example, in Scandinavia. So we've already talked a little bit about the year 536, but this time period in general is really interesting. A lot of things happened. Um, uh, of course, it's the sort of um, um, between the um, antiquity and the start of the Middle Ages, um, but right at the year 536, um, there's documentary evidence, so observers in Rome and Constantinople, um, which noticed a sort of mystery cloud in the, in the sky, um, a diminishment of sunlight, which lasted for over a year. Um, and this was written down in records. There's also a lot of archaeological evidence of um, changes at this time period, so demo um, demographic decline, um, changes in settlement, population decreases, um, changes in agriculture, which can be inferred from pollen records, um, and sacrificial gold offerings, especially in Scandinavia, where people have um, recovered um, gold that was buried with people, um, and this is interpreted as a sort of appeal to the gods to help stop a, a, a rough climatic situation. From physical records, there's also tree ring temperature reconstructions which show extreme cold, which began in the year, fi um, the year 536 and persisted for over a decade. And only really pretty recently um, have ice cores been able to show um, that there are not one but two sulfate peaks um, representing strong volcanic eruptions at this time period um, with the dates 536 and 540. So it's a lot of different evidence from different areas. So what we've tried to, how we've added to this is use a, um, uh, actually two state-of-the-art climate models um, to, which um, simulate the um, stratospheric aerosols that um, come from the volcanic eruptions and their impact on the full Earth system, so the atmosphere, oceans, um, the circulation also of the atmosphere and oceans. And so we take the ice core records, um, use um, them to derive an input into the climate model, and then look at the sort of temperatures and um, output of the climate model and ask, are they consistent with the tree rings, and are they consistent with this um, archaeological evidence? So this is our reconstruction of the impact of these volcanic eruptions on sunlight, what we call the radiative forcing um, from the uh, volcanic eruptions. And now the first eruption um, was pretty clearly in the northern hemisphere somewhere. We don't know exactly where, um, but it doesn't matter so much for our modeling. Um, and it created a strong radiative forcing in the northern hemisphere. And the second eruption in 540 um, was likely in the tropics, um, and its um, clouds spread globally, um, but was more focused in the northern hemisphere. So in terms of these two eruptions individually, they're strong, but they're not exceptionally strong. They would have ranked um, seventh and third in a reconstruction, uh, um, an existing reconstruction of the last 1,200 years. Um, but their distinguishing characteristics are, one, that they happen so closely in time to the other, and two, that they both focus their impact on the northern hemisphere. So if you just look at the northern hemisphere impact, over a 10-year period, these two eruptions would be um, uh, by far the strongest forcing of climate um, for at least the last 1,200 years. And from the climate model, then we can look at changes in temperature, um, which are shown here on uh, this plot on the left um, in over Europe. Um, and we've compared it with tree ring records from northern Scandinavia, and our model simulations agree quite well. They show temperature decreases here in summer between 1 and 3 degrees um, over most of Europe. And what we've done then is to take that a step further and try and estimate the impact that these temperatures would have on agricultural societies. Um, and what we show is that this direct impact just of the temperature on societies um, would be most prevalent in the northernmost limit um, of agriculture, um, which makes sense because a, um, a decrease in temperature is uh, a larger proportion of the annual budget of heat available um, in, the, in the north. And so in this sort of Scandinavian region around the Baltic Sea, um, because of these two eruptions, one could expect three, four, or even five years of significant decrease in agricultural productivity. Um, and it's well known that um, societies more can 
can deal with maybe one bad summer, um, but when you have a series of them, one after the other, it's going to be really hard for societies to get through that. So just to sum up again, so we've been able to show that considered together, this 536-540 double event had a stronger impact on climate than any single or sequence of eruptions from the last 1,200 years. Um, the eruptions led to northern hemisphere temperature decreases of over two degrees. Um, and I didn't show this, but significant and long-lasting changes in Arctic sea ice. Um, and the double event likely had a significant direct impact on agricultural societies, um, especially in the far north of Europe, um, for example, Scandinavia. Thank you. So I'm going to launch right in. I'm going to talk a little bit about whether drought can be considered to have contributed to famine, disease and violence in early medieval Europe, mostly really looking at the case of Ireland, which I know best, as you might be able to tell from my accent. Okay, okay so here we go. The sort of records that I look into primarily are written records, um, such as this medieval chronicle. This is a medieval Irish chronicle written in uh, sort of Middle Irish, sometimes with a sprinkling of Latin thrown in just to make it user friendly. And um, it's written in places like this. This is a major Irish monastic foundation in the Irish Midlands, Clamac Noise on the River Shannon, which was the centre for the recording of these sort of chronicles for over 600 years or thereabouts. Um, this particular vellum page just covers the years um, 852 to 858, and I've just singled out a little uh, snippet of text here to give you a flavor of the sort of uh, information that's recorded in these chronicles. They're not just um, about human events, like the foundings of churches or battles, but also about environmental phenomena, such as the ice and frost that occurred um, between 855 to 856, so that the principal lakes and rivers of Ireland could be crossed by people on foot and on horseback. So very severe climatic conditions relative to the sort of mild Irish maritime climate. And these sort of references are distributed pretty widely throughout these medieval Irish chronicles and indeed chronicles and annals across Europe and Asia for well over a millennium or several millennia. So we can take that sort of information and go to what I would call natural archives. Um, Perhaps one of the most well-known natural archives are tree ring growth widths that reflect various uh, climate parameters. This is a section of ancient Irish oak um, preserved in the margins of a bog in Ulster where for over 1,500 years because the bog is water is very acidic. It suppresses microbial activity, so basically this, uh, the oaks, when they fall and die in this water, are preserved for a long period of time. What we see here are annual growth rings and basically these trees are, are mainly precipitation sensitive so when the spring summer tends to be wetter they tend to grow better and so you see the tree growing pretty well up to the year 532 when which is marked here and then it starts to grow more poorly but that's not beyond the bounds of normal growth here this is when it becomes very very unusual and you really need a microscope to see the growth ring and if we go to the chronicles in Ireland at this time, even though they're very vestigial at this stage, we see a cryptic report for 538 of the failure of bread, um, which basically implies a widespread harvest failure. And tellingly is also at the sort of time that our previous speakers have been speaking about in terms of a major volcanic event. So these chronicles also report drought, um, such as this example for 1575 where we have intense heat and drought in the summer of this year. There was no rain for one hour by night or day from Bialtain, 1st of May, to Lammas, which is 1st of August. And the chroniclers then say that a loathsome disease and dreadful malady arose from this heat, namely the plague. They go on to give some details about where this was uh, concentrated within Ireland and say that many a castle was left without a guard, many a flock without a shepherd, and many a noble corpse without burial. So very serious conditions in terms of disease and often you will find 
great droughts and other extreme weather events linked to famines and um, other disease outbreaks in these chronicles through time. Going back to the Irish oaks, we could plot out very simply their um, annual growth widths of a large number of Irish oaks averaged together. This is just a little snippet of time, I think 720 up to 748, 728 maybe. And you see basically that the oaks are growing normally, but as we get up to 737, 738, there's a pronounced and sudden decrease in growth. And that signifies most likely a severe drought. Sorry, wrong way. And if, indeed, if we go to some documentary evidence, we can see that a great drought is actually reported in 737. Now, the chronicles are full of very uplifting stuff, like a whole range of violence and conflict year on year. It's really quite grim, actually. And this is a, six, a woodcutting from the 16th century, depicting what the, some of the types of violence that you might see reported systematically in medieval chronicles. This is the cattle raid. So these guys are coming in, they're burning the farmstead, and they're driving off the cattle. So it's possible to go through these chronicles um, for over a thousand years and just basically quantify the number of different types of violent event that are occurring. If we go back now, just as this little case study, to our uh, oak growth um, around the 730s, and just now overlay a count of the number of deaths and violent conflict in the Irish Chronicles, what we see is a large spike basically coinciding with the trees telling us that there's something severe had happened environmentally. And you have to take my word for it, but this is a, basically a recurring pattern. It doesn't happen in every case of every drought. Of course, not society is resilient often. But if we look at violence and we look at oaks over a thousand year time period, this sort of thing repeats itself. So it suggests that there is a sort of persistent and ongoing um, mechanism or set of mechanisms, which are probably quite complex, by which extreme weather can act to trigger increased violence. Okay. And again, this is actually, if we look a little bit closer to Chronicles, the year of one of the most famous Irish battles of the early medieval period, the Battle of the Groans, as it was uh, called in the Chronicles. And men say that so many fell in this great battle that we could find no comparable slaughter in a single onslaught and fierce conflict throughout all preceding ages. Of course, they say that every time there's a big battle. But this was certainly a big and important battle that set the political scene in Ireland for the next century or so. Okay, so again, I had already alluded to the fact that uh, not all droughts will cause this sort of increase in violence, and it's not weather and environmental conditions don't determine really what happens in society. They certainly have a strong influence, and if um, institutions, for example, are set up in a robust fashion, the society can, we even a medieval society, can weather drought and can basically restore order quite quickly. If we looked at a large number of oaks across Europe, you can see basically in the year 1050 that there's a very, very widespread drought. This is in the recently published Old World Drought Atlas. And if we went to um, Ireland and looked at the chronicles, and you can see the drought is very severe in Ireland too, we have a report of much inclement weather which carried away corn, milk, fruit and fish from the people so that it grew up dishonesty among all, so that no protection was extended to church or fortress until the clergy of Munster assembled with their chieftains and enacted a law and a restraint upon every injustice. And then, of course, they would credit it that God gave peace and favorable weather in consequence of this law. But this example basically just shows that even medieval society is robust and it has coping mechanisms to extreme events in a lot of cases. And for them to have a very, very marked impact, they need to be either very, very severe, come in uh, clusters of events, perhaps like the volcanic double event we've seen, or happen in a historical context where there is a preceding political instability or so forth. So just what to take away in total from this little case study, I think that the historical record is frequently untapped and dismissed in terms of its value as an environmental archive. I think that the combination of written and natural archives can be very powerful, and the droughts and other extremes can trigger major societal stresses and conflict under the right political and social conditions, and that's a salutary lesson for today. But we don't want to be 
environmentally deterministic here, and certainly past societies had coping mechanisms, and they're not simply passive victims to what's happening in the weather. Okay, that's, that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the fascinating presentations. We'll now open the floor for questions, and I already see a couple of hands. Thank you very much. Uh, Marlo Hood with AFP. Uh, just uh, two quick questions, if I may. Uh, first, a general one for either Keese or Matthew. How is it that the impacts from volcanoes remain so localized in terms of affecting the northern hemisphere, for example? Uh, why, once all those particles are up in the stratosphere, don't they spread more evenly? Uh, then a question for Matthew. Um, you se seem to be in the market for a tropical volcano in 540. Uh, Keith seems to have one on offer. Uh, are you buying? <laughs> Maybe I'll just do the second one first. Um, I think it's still an open question. Um, really, the only way that I know of to definitely say what a, an eruption was um, this far back in time um, is to, from the, uh, the ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica, um, sometimes one finds tephra particles, so actual particles of ash. Um, and this ash from different volcanoes has a different chemical signature. So if one can find this ash in the ice cores and match it up with a particular volcano somewhere on Earth, then one has a pretty um, good idea that that's where the source is. Um, that's the, the gold standard. Um, and in this case, that hasn't yet been done. Um, we're, we're hoping that that could be done at some point, but, but we will see. Um, otherwise, in terms of, from my perspective as a climate modeler, um, it's just clear that it came from the tropics. and. The actual source, uh, to me, it, it would have the same global impacts, whether it was El Chichan or um, um, the, the other, El Pango. Um, yeah. yeah. And in terms of your first question, um, uh, Kiki, you can jump in if you want. But um, So the, the aspects which control the spread of the aerosols of, across the globe are, are varied. There's different things. The latitude of the eruption, of course, is important. Um, so in my case, we had a very clearly a, um, an eruption first in the northern hemisphere, somewhere in the in mid latitudes or high latitudes, um, and that usually constrains the cloud to that hemisphere. Um, tropical eruptions can be more complicated; they can spread evenly around the globe, or they can be a little bit biased towards one hemisphere, and that depends a little bit on the circulation of winds in the stratosphere. Um, depends on um, again the latitude within the tropics where that eruption was. Um, and also potentially the season of the eruption, because this, the wind patterns in the stratosphere change depending on the season. Hello, my name is Antonio Sanchez with the Spanish News Agency. I, I have a question I, can, I think I can address to all of you. Uh, taking all these uh, uh, historical examples, um, uh, can we draw a general conclusion about uh, how good or how quick uh, uh, human societies can react uh, or adapt uh, to this kind of uh, events and, and to learn some lessons to apply to the current situation, even though this is the, the, the current uh, climate change uh, uh, is a man-made uh, event, but can we learn some, some, some lessons to make a, be optimistic or pessimistic how good we can uh, adapt to, 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 a, to a climate crisis? Thank you. Um, I can jump in there, yeah. start us off. Um, I think uh, there's there, these guys here are looking at rather uh, rapid changes in climate relating to uh, volcanic eruptions. What we look at in terms of the Roman period is probably a more gradual change, although the magnitude is quite big. And I think that's, there's a number of issues. It's like Francis was saying, how resilient is that society? What is the magnitude of the change and what is the rate of the change? So if the magnitude is quite big, but it happens over uh, a long period, then society has the chance to adapt. If it's a quite big magnitude, but it happens very rapidly, then maybe that society doesn't have the chance to adapt. So in terms of climate change, at the moment, it's relatively gradual, but there are tipping points within the climate system. And if, those, if we could go over those tipping points, maybe we won't be able to adapt. I don't know if anyone... I guess I would say in terms of drought, uh, also like recurrence, recurrent drought periods, maybe not too severe, um, allow a society to adapt because what you also see in, in some of the literatures that they're saying that the earlier droughts in the Mayas, also in the fifth century, already 
um, motivate them to act in terms of maybe uh, a terrorist building or like race fields or like so in that sense if it doesn't <laughs> wipe you away completely I mean you can uh, yeah there is room for adaptation um, also within history what you see I guess I would just add that, yeah, absolutely, there are coping mechanisms that can be applied and um, adaptations to sudden climatic shocks, which is what I had really looked at, as opposed to longer-term changes, which are harder, I think, to, to understand in terms of their impacts on society. But the ability to adapt or to cope with these sort of extreme events really depends upon things like the whether there was pre-existing social instability, ongoing conflict already at the time of, of a sudden climatic shock, whether the, the institutions of governance, whether they're poor or they're exploitative, or whether a large proportion of the society is politically or economically marginalized. These are all sorts of things that will impact upon how readily a society will adapt to a sudden climatic shock. <clears throat> I'm uh, uh, Govert Schilling, freelancer from the Netherlands. Um, I seem to remember that the sixth century event has also been attributed by some people to a cosmic impact, like a comet or an asteroid. With this information about the volcano, can we say this is not true at all, or is there still room for some extraterrestrial uh, event? Oh, I, I think that the author of the, the who proposed the cosmi uh, cosmic event, I think he already changed his opinion. Uh, I think it's, he also indicated it's more likely that it was from a volcanic eruption. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. that was Mike Bailey. So he has accepted that a, a volcanic eruption would be more um, likely, or a double volcanic eruption. Um, and he proposed this cometary hypothesis in the absence of ice core evidence for um, a volcanic eruption at the time when there was such abundant tree ring and societal evidence for a major um, environmental event. So volcanic eruption, I think we'd all agree, is probably more, more likely, but it doesn't for strictly exclude other contributions. Thank you. Are there any further? Uh, Jonathan Amos, BBC. Keys, could you just talk about why you have more confidence in your dating um, for your volcano than, than people had in the the, the carbon dates for the for the other volcano. Yeah. Well, so it's quite difficult to date volcanic deposits, so, um, because especially in this period that you have the plateau in the uh, calibration curve. And well, the people from the Ilopango, they well, they only used one uh, carbonized tree trunk, and we combined different uh, from the, uh, different lines of evidence from local deposits. Uh, but also air fall deposits and the signal in the beach ridge system. And they all indicate that, that the eruption must be around 540. And if you combine these three different dating techniques, you get a more accurate dating. So that's why we reduced our t time window to, to plus or minus 60 years. And that's, well, that's much better than was possible with, uh, with the Ilpango eruption. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? No? Uh, if not, we'll finish here. Thank you very much for your presentations. Thank you all very much for coming. The next press conference at 11 on finding more from fossils. If any of you wants to interview any of the panelists, we have interview rooms available on the right of the press center. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.